I give you Jennifer Michael Hecht. <laughs> well, I'm so glad to be here. I've been enjoying the conference so much. Thank you all for coming. Um, I sort of want to start off by just saying that, you know, there's a, a tremendous amount of hope that's been expressed here and also a tremendous amount of despair. Both are reasonable. Um, but I want to say that the very first thing that we can do to forward the goals that we have is to show up, to do what you're doing right now, to be here. Um, I have uh, in um, The Happiness Myth, uh, my book that's sort of on this a skeptical look at what we think of as the good life right now, um, I have a quote, which is, um, it's great to come out of the closet, but you also have to leave the house. <laughs> and we really do. The, the, the first line is to get together, to see each other, to encourage each other, to be here, to remember that we are here. The second line is to remember that we've been here a while. Um, when I wrote Doubt, I had no idea how many atheists I was going to find throughout history. And uh, discovering that was, I mean, I, I knew they were there. Um, I, I already had a PhD in history, and I had written about some atheists in the modern period. So I, I knew a certain amount of the history of atheism. But when I did the research, I was astounded to find not just that there were people who said no in every period all over the world throughout history, but that people who had, had another suggestion for how to live, how to live a good life, how to dedicate ourselves to each other, to good work, to, to, to art, to admiring the, the universe as we have it. And I was empowered by it tremendously. Tremendously, the feeling that the, that you can have, especially in the United States today, that the Christian world is too big, that it's too strong. You study the history of our movement, and you don't have that feeling anymore. You realize that we've been, you know, there's a long, strong history of, of atheism and irreligion. There are uh, many atheist women in history. Um, it's. Today I'm going to sort of zero in on a particular story, but I first want to just tell you that I had an incredible smorgasbord of women I could have chosen to talk about. There's a reason I chose what I did, but I first just want to say that I found women, atheists, doubters, irreligionists, secularists throughout history all over the world. Um, from the Bible itself, Job's wife says, curse God and forget him. She's the first one who says, forget it. He comes along later. Um, there's, uh, there's the Greek and Roman followers of atheist philosophy. There, there are women among them. And we know there were tons more, but we do have a few names. We know that there were certain individuals, which let us know that there were other ones. Um, in the last 20 years, we've been translating the uh, transcripts of the in Inquisition and finding they're not just heretics who believe instead of this crazy thing, that crazy thing. There's a lot of them that believe what we believe, that it was all crazy. And many of them were women. People who were educated and were able to look back to the Greek and Roman philosophies and say, this makes a lot more sense to me than this magical stuff and others who were not educated, but were still able to say, the, the, the bubonic plague took my whole family. No good human would do that to someone. We are the locus of morality, and you can't tell me that God is the locus of morality, because if there's a ruler of the universe, he killed my whole family. I don't buy it. It's an incredible record that we have. And it's all coming to light now as we're doing these translations. And there were, as I said, many women as well as men. There were a host of 19th century women atheists. I can only barely touch on them. I'll mention Fanny Wright because Lauren just did. Fanny Wright was incredible. Um, people loved her. She was so charming that even the other side loved her. And she, she, she bought a plantation in the South, freed the slaves, and gave it to them. 
She bought a church in New York City and turned it into a hall of reason where you could go and learn. There were, but she had a bookstore with Tom Paine, contraception books. I mean, she was an amazing figure. We just we have to we have to be the one who cultivate this this memory. All of this stuff is on Wikipedia. You don't have to go into our secret enclaves to find it. It's out there. <laughs> you know, every Bible has Ecclesiastes, which is one of the most irreligious books in the I mean, the race is not to the swift nor the battle to the strong, but time and chance happeneth to them all. Um, Job is a entirely questions the notion of a, of a good, ordered world. It's in every hotel room, right there for any of us. <laughs> um, but there are so many names. I'm just going to throw out a few of them. Uh, Ernestine Rose was a Jewish secularist atheist, went around the country in the 19th century, lecturing, made her living lecturing on atheism. Um, uh, George Eliot, who we all know as, as an author of novels, where she also translated atheist texts. She was out and proud. Um, of course, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, uh, we've mentioned her a couple of times at this conference, an amazing figure who was the leader of the, the feminist movement and who decided sort of later in her life that, that the problems of women were so rooted in religion that she was willing to be hated by some feminists who were religious to do the work she thought was most important, which was to, which was to take apart religion. And she wrote the Women's Bible. She tried to get a bunch of women to help her, and they did contribute a little bit, but she, she, was, she was the bravest of them and she really wrote most of it, and it's hilarious. Um, it, it's supposed to be a sort of feminist critique, but in the, by the end, she's just making fun of the whole thing. Um, it's, it's great, uh, and it was a bestseller, bestseller. Um, and she knew she was gonna, she was gonna be uh, shut out of the feminist movement, and Anthony told her so, but she said it was more important to speak the truth. And it was. There are many ways in which we don't remember this stuff, but it changed the world anyway. We don't always remember the exact specifics, but it changed the climate. It changed the way people think. Um, Margaret Sanger is another one. Atheist. No gods, no masters. That was her. And she was the person who got contraceptive, contraception legal in this country. She was at the forefront of that. She was a proud feminist, big atheist. We have some trouble with her now because there was some eugenics involved in what she was thinking, but it's, it's hard to find any. I mean, Thomas Jefferson had slaves. We, you know, Plato said women were, you really have to pick and choose some of the time. <laughs> if you want to have any heroes at all, you got <laughs> to pick and choose a little bit. So today I want to talk to you about someone you've never heard of because um, I think it's important. Her name is Clémence Royer. She was a French woman. She was born in 1830, died in 1902, and she was the French translator of Darwin. So, so Darwin publishes in 1859. Royer translates his work into French in 1871, and it's the first most French people find out about Darwin. Now, this is so important to everyone because the French really, they really found um, anthropology. They create the first anthropological school, and um, Americans come to France, to Paris, to study with them, and then come back here and start anthropology here. And anthropology was begun in France by people who were first meeting as a group as atheists, and then decided together to form anthropology. And they did so because of Clemence Royer and her version of Darwinism, and because of Paul Broca's uh, investigations of the brain. Royer wrote a 37-page introduction to Origin of the Species, in which she said that this proved atheism. Darwin was so careful about the whole thing, he never went anywhere near it. She said, this proves atheism, we're done with religion, and she talks about it for 37 pages. <laughs> Darwin mentions human beings in one line. It's all about pigeons. 
Origin of the Species. I don't know if you've tried to read it, but it's all about pigeons. In one line, he says, and this will throw light on the origins of humanity, the very last line of the book. Her introduction is 37 pages about how we came from the animals and what this means and how liberating this is and how we're now done with religion. Um, it had a profound effect on all of France and how France took in evolution. In England, it was shocking the degree to which people read it, realized, you know, Huxley said that this was against religion and stuff, but most people read it and said, nature, who's doing the natural selection, man, eh, nature's God. Something's doing the selecting, that's, but you couldn't do it in France, not with Royer's preface. So in France, evolution was atheist and anti-religion, and it changed everything. Um, I thought I'd give you a quick quote. Uh, people were speaking about Royer. Um, they considered Darwin to have been, quote, surpassed before he was even fully understood. Uh, because the preface, because uh, the remarkable preface into which Madame Clemence Royer condensed all the significant substance of the origin of the species, the translator had seen more clearly and farther than his author, than her author. Sorry, that was that's from the period, and the um, the here's here's a quick quote from from her translation. Yes, I believe in revelation but a permanent revelation of man to himself and by himself, a rational revelation that is nothing but the result of progress of science and of the contemplation of conscience, a revelation that is always only partially, partial and relative, that is effectuated by the acquisition of new truths and even more by the elimination of ancient errors. We must also attest that the progress of truth gives us as much to forget as to learn, and we learn to negate and to doubt as much as to affirm. And this is the version of Darwinism that came into France. So France builds anthropology in a, in, a, in a completely atheist way and very much against the Catholic Church. Now what's fascinating is that it's not just building on Darwin. It's also building on Paul Broca's work. You might have remembered, uh, Carl Sagan wrote a book called Broca's Brain. It's not really about Broca at all. The intro is just Carl Sagan talking about how he goes to France and he goes into the, uh, the, the Natural History Museum and he sees all these brains. And he finds out that Broca's brain is one of them. And Broca was this 19th century scientist who really founded anthropology and also a lot of, uh, of neurology. And there was his brain floating in a jar. And Sagan was talking about how science changes different sort of fads of science, and how now we don't keep the brains of our scientists in jars that much. <laughs> the thing is, Broca, in 1861, Broca finds the first relationship between brain morphology, brain weight, shape, size, and abilities, personalities, traits, he finds, he's got this, he hears about this patient whose nickname is Tan, because that's all he says, Tan, Tan. And Tan, he meets Tan, he talks to him, he, he studies him for a couple of years, and then Tan dies. And he autopsies Tan's brain, and he finds that a lesion on the third left frontal circumvolution, that's the French version, uh, uh, convolution is what we say in English. The third left frontal convolution of the brain is Broca's aphasia. If you have a lesion on the third left frontal convolution of the brain, you will have trouble speaking, even if your intelligence is perfectly intact. The Catholic Church was incredibly threatened by this because at the time, the idea was that the brain doesn't think. It's just the seat of the soul. How could the meat think? That's still one of the strangest things in the world. Right? It's stranger than virgin birth. It's the strangest thing. I mean, that's the wonderful thing about secularism. We get more wonder and mystery. I mean, we're all in here looking out at each other. The meat is thinking. <laughs> it's a good trick, right? And we have wonder cornered. They're just copying it. Anyway, so, so Broca finds this relationship, which becomes Broca's aphasia. 
But these anthropologists, these people who are meeting as atheists and then get wind of Darwin. Remember, Darwin gets translated in 71. Broca's aphasia is found in 61. So these atheists who were friends with Broca, because Broca was a, he was kind of on the DL, but he was an atheist. And he was meeting with these people, and they decide, we have the records of their conversations, to form anthropology. And they form it on the basis of Royer's Darwin and Broca's understanding of the brain as a, as a scientifically studyable thing, right? I mean, Descartes was the one way back who said, let's separate these two things. Science can have everything but thought. Thought will lead to religion. Well, Broca says, no, 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 we're gonna, we're gonna figure out thought too. So the Society of Anthropology is formed in Paris. Uh, at first, it's all men, but Clémence Royer petitions to join. They say she can't because she's a woman. She goes to Broca and says, can I? He says, of course you can. Forget that. And she comes in. So she's a full member of the uh, Society of Anthropology, and she shows up all the time. She gives papers. Um, at the Society of Anthropology, in the early 1870s, they decide to form the Society of Mutual Autopsy. It's a provocative name purposefully designed to annoy the Catholic Church. <laughs> you're supposed to, in the Catholic understanding, your body is going to be resurrected exactly as it goes in the ground. You go in the ground without an arm, you're coming up without an arm. So dissection was just verboten, and cremation was forbidden. Certainly this idea of the Society of Mutual Autopsy was absolutely against, but they got it through. And Broca was, Broca, when he died, he was actually a senator for life. They'd made him this, um, Victor Hugo actually fought for him. Anyway, um, he had the clout to form the Society of Mutual Autopsy. I'd read about it in these tiny little things, and then I went to France, went to the Musée de l'Homme in the basement. They had the, down this winding staircase, they had these cabinets. They, they, at first, they made me go through all these hoops to, just to get in, just to, I'd have to order it. They'd bring me the thing two hours later. After a couple of weeks, they got bored of me, and they just threw me the keys. So I would go down there myself. Um, just total aside, once I, I look at, it says cliches. I, I'm a poet, I gotta tell you. You see a box that says cliches from the late 19th century. <laughs> I took it down, it was rubber stamps. That was the old name for rubber stamps. Isn't that amazing? And they all said the Society of, of Anthropology. Anyway, um, so it was there that I found the documents from the Society of Mutual Autopsy. For uh, 30 years, these scientists, as they died, dissected each other's brains to try to find more relationships like Broca's aphasia. Broca helped with the dissections in 1880, Broca's brain was dissected by these same guys. And Clémence Royer joined this group. And we have her testament, her last will and testament in which she says, I don't want to give a penny to the priests. I want my body taken care of by scientists. So that in, in this book, The End of the Soul, and also in the work that I'm doing now, because I'm revisiting this early work that I did, um, I really came to understood to understand on some level a kind of uh, secular version of Catholic last rites. They were keeping relics of each other. They were imbuing their deaths with meaning, but they were also forwarding science, and they were extremely aware of that. And it wasn't just Royer. There were many other women involved in this as well. Um, the, uh, uh, when, um, in one of the last sessions, uh, Helen Hamilton Gardner, who wrote um, Men, Women, and Gods, remember that? She's an American, um, but when she was alive, uh, giving lectures and talks about atheism, there was a, a, a research paper that came out that said that women's brains were inferior to men's. And because she was also a follower of these, eight, these French anthropologists, she donated her brain to science. And her brain is still floating in a jar in a Chicago collection, anybody can see, um, because of this same idea. Um, and this notion of, of saying, you know, 
um, I don't believe in some spiritual idea of things. I believe in the physical world as amazing and weird and strange as it is. Men and women have both been involved in this for a long time. Um, in uh, 1893, the Free Thought Convention, it was the second annual Free Thought Convention. You know what it was, it was dedicated to? The Rights of Women, 1893. It's wonderful, and you gotta love it, and it's great to know, but it's also important to notice that we've sort of forgotten it. We really have to remember this stuff in order for it to give us the, pa give it, for it to give us the power that it can have. Um, and Roye was celebrated at this, um, which is, uh, it's an amazing thing. Um, the, uh, um, I'll say that Roye is interesting also because she believed a lot of what people were saying about brains at the time, and she thought that she'd been born with a man's brain. It's kind of sad, because a lot of other women at the time realized it was all just bunk, and a lot of men realized it was bunk. There was a guy named Léonce Manouvrier who really argued against all of this stuff and got, and got it thrown out. And um, a lot of American anthropology came out of this guy, Alice Herdlicka, who had studied with uh, Manouvrier. Manouvrier said if it's the size of the brain, Broca had said that women are a little less intelligent than men, and their brains are a little smaller, so that must be a relationship but he didn't account for body mass. But when he studied the difference between the French and the Germans, the German brains were all heavier than the French. Well, that can't be right. So <laughs> then he studied for the body mass, and the body mass matched up. So there were, and, and Manouria pointed this out, and he also was like, you know, if brain weight was so important, whales would be building cities. <laughs> it's just not, it's not, a, it's not what it looks like. Um, I think it's super important that we remember this particular type of thing. Um, I mean, the point that I was trying to make, I think I've already made, but I want to add on to it that the idea of science being on our side is a great thing, and many times it is, but it also crops up over and over this issue of whether our brains are innately this way or that way. And I would like to suggest that any time you hear anybody talking about whose brains are this way or that way based on science, you know, I ask them, why don't they study the difference between short men and tall men's brains? Tall men seem to do better in a lot of business and politics, so likely we're gonna find some. There are pol political interests that change the way we think about things. And if you're gonna try to make scientific reasons for certain political differences, you better make them for all these other ones too. But we don't. There are ways of thinking these things through um, that allow us to dismiss it. And the books have already been written. You, you, we don't have to make this stuff up, these critiques of bad science. They're out there. Um, we just have to we just have to stay on them. Um, the last couple of things I'll say is just that um, I want to note that in the 19th century and the, um, the early 20th century, atheism was much more respectable than it is now. Um, uh, Edison was interviewed for the New York Times in um, 1913, said he doesn't believe in any kind of God or afterlife, right on the cover of the New York Times. Um, got in a little trouble for it, but he said it and he survived. Um, there were tons of atheists. Really, the Cold War shut it down. Um, the, the Soviet Union was atheist, and so it became treasonous. And that's, it's in the 1950s that, that God went on the money, that God went into the pledge. And you can read the congressional uh, conversations. It was all about separating ourselves from communist Russia. Our most murderous enemy is no longer atheist, an atheist country. It's now places that are more religious than we are. And so we can, we can trust, I think, that we can work this and, and realize that we're on the upswing. So I also want to mention, just quickly, Hubert Har Harrison, a great African-American atheist from the early 20th century. I mean, we have to realize that there are, Colleen Collins wrote atheist poems of a black woman. Um, there's just so many interesting people who were doing this sort of thing and pa paving the way for us. Um, so again, I wanna, I wanna underline that we, you can never 
realize the good you do just by showing up. You don't realize, unless you really let yourself see it, that just by showing up, we see each other, we see the crowd, we encourage each other, and, and sometimes you have to trust that even though you don't understand exactly how you're helping, you're helping. Um, it's, it's great to come out of the closet, but you gotta leave the house. <laughs> so learn your empowering history so that you feel like you, you, you know that the work that we're doing isn't going to nowhere. Also, but don't be discouraged when you see huge strides made that have been lost, that happens too. But sometimes the knowledge of them gets lost, but the change in the culture, that persists. Um, a lot of these French anthropologists I'm talking about, we don't really remember them anymore, but in 1905, France separated church and state after millennia of being a, a Catholic country. Um, and that was the work that they did. And that was Royer as much as anybody else. Um, know a little feminist theory. I know sometimes it's dense reading, but we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Just to understand a little bit, um, and, and the, the, the same kind of theory about racial inequality. It's very similar work that teaches us the subtle ways that we take advantage. And as much as you notice your own oppression, just try to notice the, the other side, the ways that we are advantaged by either where we live or the color of our skin or the, the money in our pocket. And, and recognize as much as you want what some people don't have also, you have to give away a little bit. You have to, you have to, we have to do it on both sides. Um, to speak the truth calmly, but bravely. You always feel like when somebody's going up against you, what you're gonna have to do is kind of scream or screech or argue. You don't have to do any of it. You just have to say what you think is right if they start arguing with you, say, go look it up. <laughs> but don't let it pass. Don't let it pass. That takes a huge amount of courage, but it doesn't take that much energy. You can state your truth and then get the hell out of there. <laughs> but still, don't let it pass. Support other women and other atheists. When someone comes out, find it somewhere. Just you be the one who says, yeah, yeah me too. Um, it's so important. It's so important, um, especially for the littlest things when it seems like it's about almost nothing. Just make sure that person doesn't speak to an empty sound, you know, an empty room, a silent room. Um, and don't put up with inequality. You, you have to know that even when you don't know exactly how the, the argument is working, Sometimes somebody comes up with something real clever, some bell curve that puts you down. You can stand up and say, I know that's not true because I know that human, human beings are equal. I know, and I don't have to listen to this. And you can find the books that will, that will bear it out, but you don't always have to be that guy, but you don't have to take it either. You have to know that there are people out there who have done this work, and it's been going on for a long time. I guess the last thing I'll say is just that this question of political shifting around that we also heard a little bit about, about how Republicans were more prone to ab uh, abortion rights for a little while there. Um, I don't know if you know this, but uh, for a while in the 19th century, even in the 18th century, um, the idea of evolution, though nobody had a mechanism, Darwin hadn't come out yet, nobody had a mechanism, but the idea of evolution that somehow we changed from one animal to another. That was out there, and that was more a religious position. Why? Because the Bible said there was one Adam and Eve. The assumption is that they were white. Where'd everybody else come from? So the religious had either to believe that there were many Adam and Eves, which the Bible didn't say, or Adam and Eve, changed. So evolution for a while there was a religious position. The whole idea of evolution being the sort of watermark of what side you are on, that comes out of 
of William Jennings Bryant, beginning of the 20th century, that's when fundamentalism comes around because this, uh, there was this journal called The Fundamentals. Tennessee had no high schools, very few high schools, and the government had said, you've got to have high schools. So they build these buildings, they open up the schools, they don't know what to teach. So they find these textbooks and some people who didn't want the high schools, they didn't want your kids being taken away from your house and being indoctrinated by the state. So they looked through the, the textbooks and found something that was against the church. And that's when they, they found evolution, was in one of these textbooks, and said, let's draw the line in the sand here. Meanwhile, before that, 50 years earlier, what about Joshua bid the sun stand still? That means the sun's moving, not us. We let that one go. We really have to notice how historically specific these issues are. They will change. They always change but we can get a little distance from them and not feel quite so hemmed in. Um, I think I'll stop there, but thank you so much for listening.